Thank you, Daryl. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Christ is coming. We will see the sign. Christ is coming. We will be ready. Christ is coming. Raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Praise be God. We will worship and prepare. Let us pray. Holy One, you have promised us that the day of our salvation is near. Keep us faithful in love and watchful in prayer so that we may stand with confidence and joy at the coming of Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The season of Advent 
gives us to wait. Our bodies are still, yet they reach out to the holy. The priest Zechariah declares this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For God has looked favorably upon God's people and redeemed them. It is a dedication bursting with wreaths of memory. It is a dedication, <coughs> declaration for a people to find hope in God. In the stillness, in the waiting, God is in this. On this first Sunday of Advent, <coughs> we light the candle of hope. The light of hope for you, for <coughs> me, and for this beautiful broken world. May hope burn bright in every corner of our lives. Amen. Please join us in singing verse 1 of Advent Song with the sound of your voice. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be weighed down by the sins and worries of this life, but watch and pray for the grace of God, who will save you in your time of trial. With confidence in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Your sins are pardoned. The penalty is paid.
And now let us go to the Lord in the privacy of our own hearts, lifting up our own joys and concerns. Savior God, guide us by your word and spirit that we might hear your truth and heed your call and be prepared for Christ's coming this Christmas. Amen. This year, as we await the coming of Christ, I have chosen as our Advent theme the other Christmas tree. We are starting with, uh, at the beginning of the New Testament with the first chapter of the first book. Uh, and what we find is that the Gospel of Matthew does not begin with angels and shepherds, not with donkeys, miraculous stars. The Gospel of Matthew begins with Jesus' family tree. Now, it is a rather long passage. It's full of names. Some of them are familiar, but many are not. If you've already glanced at this passage, I can imagine that you are saying to yourself, boy, am I glad I don't have to read all those names. Well, the theme really depends on reading the entire genealogy. So let us hear the whole thing as we hear this word from God from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezon, and Hezon the father of Abram, and Abram the father, Aram the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jehoiakim, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jehoanah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiod, and Abiod the father of Elakim, and Elakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Elihid. And Elihid, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Mathan, and Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. 
So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. And as we journey through Jesus' family tree, I want us to spend some time with the surprising women who are included in the family tree. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah. Now, we do not have time to hear all of their stories, but hear just a few verses from the story of Rahab in Joshua. Chapter 6, verses 22 to 25. So let us hear this word of God. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring the woman out of it and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought Rahab out along with her father, her mother, her brothers, and all who belonged to her. They brought all her kindred out and set them outside the camp of Israel. They burned down the city and everything in it, only the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her, Joshua spared. Her family has lived in Israel ever since, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The plot of every movie is essentially the same. There is a girl living in the big city. She might be a single mom or a young woman on the cusp of truly making it in her high-powered position. She has a boyfriend, but they do not seem to be on the same page right now. It's Christmas, and she is either sent by her job or just has to come home uh, for a family reason to a small town that is all decorated for the season. Well, there she meets or reconnects with a very handsome and eligible bachelor. They're not initially fond of each other, but over the course of a couple of days, they experience holiday traditions with wondering looks, and even sparks begin. Then there's a twist. There's always a twist. The woman's big city boyfriend suddenly turns up to declare his undying love and, or else, you know, she maybe gets word from, about a promotion that is going to take her back to the big city. Or a misunderstanding occurs, which makes it appear that it just won't work for the woman and the small town bachelor to be together. But in the end, all falls into place and the snow falls with one minute before the hour. They have their first kiss and the promise that they will live happily ever after. Yeah, that is a, the essential plot of nearly every Hallmark Christmas movie. And every year, I don't know where they get them, every year they have 40 or 50 of these movies. And if you miss it one time, that's okay. It's going to be shown 15, 20 times before Christmas gets here. 
you know, they have to start like in October to get all these things in. The Hallmark Christmas movie has become a cultural phenomenon, both for those who love them and for those who like to make fun of them. The formulaic plot line provides a sense of order in a chaotic world. The scenes and the traditions bring us a sense of nostalgia, while the perfect Christmas, the perfect small town America, the perfect family may not exist in the real world for two hours. And with a bit of suspension of belief, you can find the perfection you're longing for. Because we all seem to carry a vision of the perfect Christmas with the perfect family. Where did we find this vision? Was it Norman Rockwell's paintings of Christmas past? Was it Clement Clark Moore's poem with children nestled all snug in their beds? Was it a classic movie like White Christmas? Or, if you're about my age, the jerky animation of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, saving all the misfit toys? Or was it songs like Silver Bells? Or I'll Be Home for Christmas? But we have come to think of Christmas as an ideal for which we long because our real life story rarely resembles that vision. One of the things that I most appreciate about the genealogy of Jesus is that it resembles our real life more than a vision of the perfect Christmas, the perfect family. In the ancient world, genealogies were vital because they were used to confirm the legal status of important people. But while there is no one more important than Jesus, instead of a pure and noble line of ancestors, we find this family full of strange characters, in-laws and outlaws, and even some like the women who are most unexpected. If Matthew had been so insistent on including women in this genealogy, you think he would have listed the matriarchs of the family, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel. But that's not whom he includes. Instead, we find Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah. Now, Tamar was a Canaanite. She was widowed after her two husbands, both sons of Judah, were each killed by the Lord due to their wickedness. Well, Judah refuses to care for her as required by the law. So Tamar pretends to be a prostitute so that her father-in-law will sleep with her. As a result, she becomes pregnant with twins. When Judah first discovers her pregnancy, he first orders her to be burned. But then when he finds out that hmm, the, he's the father of these uh, children, he declares that Tamar is more righteous than he is. And the younger son, Perez, continues the family line. Then we find Rahab. She really was a prostitute. She showed hospitality to the two spies from Israel who came to Jericho to scout out the land. 
she hid them from the king through a flat-out lie, and then she helped them escape. She makes a declaration of faith that the Lord of Israel is the Lord of heaven and earth. And she asked that her life and the life of her family be spared when the city is taken. Joshua honors the pledge made by the spies to do so. And Rahab and her descendants have lived in as a part of Israel ever since. Now Ruth was another foreigner, a Moabite. She was also a widow. She pledges to stay with her mother-in-law Naomi when Naomi returns to Israel. Then she follows Naomi's instructions to glean from the field of Boaz. Well, Boaz takes an interest in this foreign woman who's working in his field. And at harvest time, Ruth infiltrates a men's only party on the threshing floor and lies with Boaz. He agrees to serve as her next of kin, marrying her, and once again, the family line continues. Well, the final woman mentioned does not get her own name. She's listed as the wife of Uriah. But we know her name is Bathsheba. King David sees her bathing and sends for her. Without a choice, she comes. And the king lies with her. This sets off a pregnancy, an attempt to cover it up, and finally the murder of Uriah orchestrated by the king. Now while this child dies in infancy, the second child of David and Bathsheba is Solomon, and he continues the family tree. Okay, widows who pretend to be prostitutes, a true harlot, a foreigner, and a woman forced to have sex with the king. These are the women in Jesus' family tree. As one commentator put it, a contemporary equivalent might be a review of American history that list all the presidents from George Washington to Donald Trump with the insertion at various places of women such as Sally Hemings, Harriet Tubman, Mother Jones, and Monica Lewinsky. These are women who represent exceptions to the rule, who challenged the rules, who exposed the shortcomings of the rulers, or both. Well, these are most unusual women for Matthew to include. And yet, without these named women and all the other unnamed women of faith in this genealogy, we would not have Christmas. Without Women like Mary Magdalene, uh, who was the first to visit the empty tomb. We would not have the proclamation that he is risen. From the beginning to the end of Jesus' earthly life, it is the women who enable the story and the family to continue. They're not perfect. Far from it but they are essential. Christian writer Anne Boskamp puts it like this. And his family tree names the four, four broken women, women who felt like outsiders, like has-beens, like never-beens, women who are weary of being taken advantage of, of being unnoticed and uncherished, 
and unappreciated. Women who don't fit in, who didn't know how to keep going, what to believe, where to go. Women who thought about giving up. And Jesus claims exactly those who are wandering and wondering and wounded and worn out as his. Jesus claims the four, Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, and Ruth. And he grabs you into his line and his story and his heart. And he gives you his name, his lineage, his righteousness. No matter your story, Jesus is writing you even now into a restorative story. He graces you with plain grace. Is there a greater gift you could want or need or have? Jesus comes right to your Christmas tree and looks at your family tree and says, I am your rescuer and I will set you free from all the brokenness and sinfulness and sadness. I will be the gift and I'll take you. Will you take me? We long for the perfect Christmas, the perfect small town, the perfect family of the Hallmark movies, because our real life is so far from ideal. And so the perfect one, Jesus himself, comes and looks at your family tree and my family tree and says, I'll set you free from all the brokenness and sinfulness and sadness. I'll be the gift and I'll take you. Will you take him? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us rise in body or in spirit as we are able and proclaim what we believe using the Nicene Creed, which is in the bulletin. You may be seated. Let us pray. Jesus is coming. He is coming to make all things new. Eternal God, during this season of Advent, help us prepare Christ's way. Help us center our hearts 
minds, and prayers on your holy presence in our midst. As the days grow short and the nights loom long, we praise you for these seasonal reminders that there is time for work and time for rest. For those of us who know warm houses and soft places to sleep, we give thanks for these precious gifts. We pray for those who are unhoused and those whose home is unsafe or financially insecure. May all your children get the rest they need to thrive. As divisiveness and conflict plague us and wars rage across the world, Holy God, we focus on the generosity, kindness, and care you encourage within us. As we contemplate the vulnerability of Christ, born a fragile infant in a violent world, let us drop our facades and the mask of strength we hide behind. May this season of Advent prepare us to celebrate the strength that can be found in weakness and the power held in humility and love. As your people gather in homes and churches to celebrate this season, let us be reminded of all the reasons we have to rejoice in you. Let us be reminded of your protective presence, of your gentleness and love, of your peace which passes all understanding. Guard our hearts and minds this Advent, Savior God, so we can rejoice over your faithfulness through Jesus Christ our Lord. As a people of faith, we lift these prayers to you, trusting you hear us and receive us. Finally, hear us now as we pray the prayer Christ taught us by saying together, All things in heaven and earth belong to God, who is coming in glory to reveal a new creation. We will present our tithes and offerings to the Lord in the offering plates by the back door as you enter or leave. And today is the first Sunday in December, so we will also receive the two cents a meal offering in the basket up here at the front.
Let us pray. Christ calls us to live generous and grateful lives, O God. Take these gifts we offer today and use them to the fulfillment of Christ's ministry. May these gifts help to free the captives, heal the sick, comfort the lonely, feed the hungry, heal the wounded. As Christ's hands and feet, use us, too, in service in building your beloved community. Amen. You may be seated, and I ask the uh, elders to come forward. And as they are walking forward, I say, come back again next week, because next week I'm going to lift up some of those men with weird names. <laughs> we need to hear their stories. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is not our table, and it is not a Presbyterian table. It's the Lord's table. And our risen Lord invites you to come and meet him here. Whether you have some altar, not been for a long time. Whether you know Christ well or would like to meet him for the first time, you are welcome here at this table which the Lord has prepared for us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. We give thanks, O Lord, that the days are surely coming when all the world will see the fulfillment of your promise of salvation. You alone are our righteousness, our hope for justice and peace. Blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Christ, the tree of life, we have seen the first fruit of your holy land. Though heaven and earth may pass away, Christ's word stands secure. Even now we look for the day of his coming in power and great glory. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this cup. Make us one with the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Teach us to pray night and day that we might see your, you face to face. Strengthen us in holiness, faithfulness, joy, and love, so that we may be ready at the coming of the Lord. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Spirit, we bless you, God of glory, now and forever. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus was at table with his disciples. And after giving thanks to God, he blessed the bread and broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the meal, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me.
rejoice it, rejoice it, ye Asma and me, by your presence in this building, you have fed us and strengthened us. As a mother nourishes her baby <coughs> in this waiting season, fill us with hopeful expectation that we may see the signs of your kingdom all around us and rejoice in your coming salvation and glory. Amen. Thank you. 